Welcome back, fellow time travelers. Today, we're only setting the dial back to a little over a decade ago to the year 2010. This was when Alienware dared to try and create a netbook targeted at gaming, and all starting at a price of about 799 US dollars. This is the Alienware M11X. Released near the beginning of 2010, it combined all the stylistic designs associated with the Alienware brand in a much smaller form factor. And while it skirts the line between ultra portable and netbook, the advertising I saw at the local Future Shop when it first hit the market called it a netbook, and that's what I've called it ever since. Under the hood, the M11X sports the Intel Core 2 Duo SU7300, a 1.3GHz processor that can be overclocked to 1.73GHz. For gaming, it has the NVIDIA GT335 GPU with 1GB of RAM, as well as an Intel GMA4500 for non-gaming graphical needs. The display is an 11.6-inch LCD that supports a native resolution of 1366 by 768 Rounding out the hardware is a 500GB SATA hard drive and 4GB of DDR3. And of course it supports wireless connections all the way up to 802.11n. It came pre-installed with Windows 7 and debuted with the base model at $799, with additional options adding up that could bring it up to about $1299. I've loved the look of this laptop since I first saw it on display almost 12 years ago. It's full of sharp angles and lighting details on the chassis that serve no useful purpose but always somehow made it feel futuristic to me. And even the power button gets in on it, shaped like an alien head with flashing eyes to indicate hard drive activity. And while all that extra lighting probably doesn't help the battery life, it certainly does add to the visual appeal. Despite its compact nature, it packs a lot of ports in, including USB, Ethernet, Firewire, VGA, DisplayPort, and HDMI. It also has a dual card reader and, on the other side of the unit, two headphone ports, a microphone port, and two more USB ports. That's a lot of options for such a small computer and not a single dongle in sight. The keyboard, while small and more cramped than a traditional laptop, is still perfectly serviceable, owed partially to the fact that it goes as close to the edge of the chassis as possible. The touchpad has this delightful hexagonal pattern textured into it, and it's fairly generous. The buttons underneath are usable, although they do require a lot more travel than seems necessary, and results in you having to be a little more dedicated in your clicks. One thing I definitely dislike is the highly reflective acrylic lens put over the display. It reflects just about everything and made filming this video a challenge. In fact, you'll find a mix of screen recording and screen capture later on in the video, so you don't have to deal with it as much as I did. Unfortunately, at some point, the casing broke where it attaches to the hinges, and the original owner chose the rather dumb option of drilling through the case and anchoring it from the outside. What an idiot. I bought this unit brand new as an open box machine near the end of 2010 from a local future shop and used it as my primary laptop for years. I always intended to give it some upgrades, but by the time I finally had some money to do so, it was time to move on to a new laptop instead. So I thought it would be cool today to revisit my first gaming laptop and give it the upgrades I couldn't when it was new. A fresh boot of the machine with the original hardware results in a startup time that's well over 2 minutes before you can actually start using it, and I think we can speed that up quite a bit. So today we'll be swapping out the original 5400 RPM hard drive with a new SSD and upgrading the original 4 gigs of DDR3 to 8 gigs, just to see how usable we can make it. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do anything with the original Core 2 dual processor at the core of this machine, a chip that was already two years out of date when this laptop hit the market. Even so, I can't wait to see what it can still handle. So let's get it pulled apart and get those new components installed. This machine was clearly designed with serviceability and upgradability in mind. After removing the bottom panel, the memory, hard drive, and wireless card are all readily accessible. And you can also see how hard they work to pack all this tech into such a small frame with these seemingly random speaker positions. And with the new hard drive and RAM installed, let's see if it still turns on. Yeah. 
And it does. Taking a look at the BIOS, it looks like the new RAM and hard drive are all visible. Of course, it's not going to do much without an operating system, so let's get a fresh install of Windows 7 installed on in it from a USB stick. And with a fresh install of Windows on there, it feels much quicker than before. The old hard drive was definitely holding it back, and there was likely a bit of bloatware in there too. Of course, I had to transfer over some of the original Alienware wallpapers because they just fit the machine so well. Like its bigger brothers, this laptop allows you to fully customize the lighting on it using the AlienFX application. The logo, keyboard, and various lighting regions can all be changed independently, allowing you to make them your own. Now let's see how this 12-year-old laptop handles being a daily driver. For regular internet browsing and email, it's perfectly usable. Obviously, Windows 7 is out of date, but most major browsers still support it. When it comes to YouTube performance, 1080p gets pretty jittery. Not that the display supports it anyways. Dropping things down to 720p, playback gets really good. And it's a lot closer to the native resolution on the LCD. Just for kicks, I decided to try playing a 1080p video using VLC player, and it was fine. So if you wanted to use this as a mobile media device, it looks like it would handle it no problem. Of course, using it as a basic office computer is no problem as well. OpenOffice runs quite happily on this rather outdated hardware, but I wouldn't expect this to be much of a challenge for even a single core machine. Obviously, this machine was not built with office work in mind, so let's see how it handles games of the era as well as maybe some modern titles. Most of the gaming I did on this machine when it was new was as a portable MAME machine. It was small enough that I could take it anywhere, and when I played vertical games, I would just flip it on its side and use as much of that screen as the game would allow. But most of the titles supported by MAME already ran fantastic on this laptop. So, other than load times, these upgrades aren't going to have much of an effect at all. Star Trek Armada was recently released by GOG, so I decided to see how well it would run. The cutscenes were a bit choppy, which was surprising since Armada only requires a Pentium 1. But it's a game that's been really more missed than hit for me on operating systems past Windows XP, and I was just glad to find that the actual game worked perfectly. So overall, I think the GOG release is going to be great for Star Trek or RTS fans. Moving on to a game that was released the same year as the M11X was, I decided to try Fallout New Vegas. I'll be honest, I've never actually played any of the Fallout games before, something I plan to remedy in the near future. Unfortunately, I won't be doing it on this machine. If it was all I had at the time, I probably would have tried to deal with the subpar frame rates, but as it stands, the experience here is not great. This is the version of the game that was released on Steam, so I'm not sure if it's been modified from the original version. But as it stands, the gameplay experience is pretty rough. Since an FPS from 2010 was a bit of a bust, I thought I'd try one that I played the hell out of back in 2008, Left 4 Dead. It ran absolutely fine on widescreen default settings, usually staying between 50 and 60 frames per second. And before you ask, yes I did just beat the first level using a touchpad. Not ideal, but you work with what you've got. From there I moved on to something that isn't nearly as resource hungry, Super Meat Boy. I didn't expect this title to give the M11X any issues and, as expected, it played flawlessly. That means there's no lag or choppiness for me to blame my lack of talent on, but I'll probably blame the controller anyways. Moving forward to a game that was released in 2012 but has seen plenty of updates since, I wondered if Counter-Strike Global Offensive might run well on this for some casual fragging. But unsurprisingly, the frame rate stayed well in the low double digits, even often dropping into single digits from time to time. I was still able to pull off some kills, but only because the bot AI is terrible. Don't Starve Together is a game my friends and I have been revisiting on weekends over the past few weeks, and the M11X runs it just fine. There were small occasional stutters, but if you had a friend over and wanted to start up a match, this would definitely work in a pinch. And now the big question on everyone's mind. Does it run Minecraft? And the answer is, sort of. If you install an older version of Minecraft, like 1.11.2 from back in December of 2016, you'll get a pretty passable experience with the default settings. There are occasional stutters and lag, but on the whole, you'd likely be able to keep yourself alive in survival mode. 
I then moved on to 1.17.1, which is from 2021, and single player mode is unplayable. It takes forever for it to load an already generated world, and once you're in there, it single frame rates pretty much constantly. Playing on a server, which offloads a lot of the work from the local machine, you'll see these rates jump up to the point where you could probably grit your teeth and push through it, but I feel it falls into the ground of you trying to prove that you can versus having an enjoyable experience. So where does the Alienware M11X land in current times? Well, it's an excellent way to play some older titles, perhaps ones dated a year or two before its release. And there's likely a whole range of indie games out there that would live quite happily on it. In terms of a daily driver, it's a great example of how an older machine, even one more than a decade out of date, can still handle basic tasks such as office work, email, and media consumption. I'll be keeping an eye out for a replacement shell so I can restore it to its former glory, and I hope to get my hands on one of its larger siblings in the future so I can put them head to head and find out what was lost in the downsize. Hey, thanks for watching until the end. If this type of content is your jam, I'd invite you to subscribe and become a fellow time traveler and join me for all my future exploits. And check out one of the videos on the screen now, I bet you'll love it. That's it for this one, but I'll see you again in a couple of weeks.